We're not going to be able to hear from our uh, Tika contingent or the ladies from Costa Rica. But in a sense, it's a good thing. It's because they're so busy here seeing so many people. And that's good news because there's a terrific struggle shaping up in Costa Rica. We're going to be discussing the issue head on in the next section of the course, which is the whole question of globalism. But the issue for them is the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which both liberal and conservative um, policymakers feel would be a wonderful thing. And everybody who actually experiences on the ground knows that it's going to be a disaster. And every Central American country has been jawboned into signing on to this thing, except Costa Rica. Now they're leaning on Costa Rica pretty heavily. President of Costa Rica, Oscar Arias, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, came on shortly after the Costa Rica revolution where they got rid of the army. Uh, one of the seven Nobel Peace Prize winners who's supporting nonviolent peace force. All of these good things, but he was president for quite a while, then was retired and then came back, got elected again. And part of his platform was that they should accept NAFTA. So there's a big indigenous grassroots movement uh, working against that. So I won't need your services today, <coughs> Sam or Nubia, for translation. But uh, what we're going to do instead is move now into the next unit. We've been talking about specifically insurre <coughs> insurrectionary struggles. And I want to follow up just very slightly with the uh, Serbo-Croatian area and the film that we saw, Bringing Down a Dictator. The people at the Center for no International Center for Nonviolent Conflict, ICNC, who come to this with a great advantage, having a multimillionaire supporter. This is an important educational institution now. And they are hooked up with Steve York and they made all of the they, they made all the films that were part of the Force More Powerful series. And that was a very <laughs> big breakthrough because this is the first time nonviolent film series was shown on public television in the US. Highly entertaining. Um, then they spent three years, hi Marcella, developing this uh, DVD, which is the world's first nonviolent strategy di video game. Uh, I've tried to play it, but a, I'm too old, and B, it seems to be a very complicated game. The hope for this was not that they would make millions of dollars and appear on Netflix and YouTube and all of these things. The actual uh, reason for producing this game was that when you have an insurrection that gets started and you have people who don't know how to run it, which is fairly typical, you know, here. You know, plug in your parameters and we'll give you the strategy. Or we'll at least help you to derive the strategy. I don't know that that has happened yet, but if and when it does, it'll be the first <laughs> time that a nonviolent insurrection succeeded that was based on a video game. Why not? I mean, video games are based on reality. Why shouldn't reality be based on video games? And they also produced a player's guide for version 1.0. If any of you guys are interested, you can uh, you know, take this out, give them some feedback, be part of the beta testing, and just flip through this and see how they've done it. it it's all based on um, the, the Balkans and Eastern Europe and, and those kinds of conditions. And they didn't say anything in there about third-party nonviolent intervention. I told them that and they said, you're absolutely right, but it was too late. They also produced this CD, lots of show and tell today. They also produced this CD, which is just basically a list of resources on nonviolent conflict. And uh, Freedom House, which is not, uh, what should we say? I'm trying to think of a delicate way to put this. They're not flaming radicals, Freedom House. Uh, y y get it? <laughs> they uh, produced this. Uh, very uh, thorough political science type surveys of 
nonviolent versus violent transitions to democracy. And they give you tons and tons of data here. And they're able to demonstrate w at least one very important thing. I'm, I'm looking for some of their really spectacular charts. Yeah, so you can see how quantitative this, this really is. This is science. <laughs> now, here, you, for me, you just get these anecdotes, <laughs> which are very good for converting your roommate. But this is science. One important thing that they were able to show is that where nonviolence played a predominant role in the transition to democracy, the democracy was much more stable. It didn't kick, kick back as quickly. Um, unfortunately, if you read some of the journalistic accounts that have now become part of recent history on that event that you saw the film about, they will say things like, a mob descended on Belgrade. So absolutely no consciousness that there was training, that people had knew that they were coming up to a nonviolent moment. You saw that scene in the apartment house with, with that final pep talk. This is your protest. This is what we've been waiting for. This is a nonviolent moment. They go up and do it. They went out and did it perfectly. Virt practically no uh, injuries. You know, they call it child's play, but anyway, practically no injuries. Spectacularly successful nonviolent uprising based on almost a year of training, and all the journalists can say is it was a mob. However, we are going to change all of that. I've been trying for a long time to arrange for fellowships at the School of Journalism for tax graduates. Um, so if you know if you know somebody who has a lot of millions of dollars, send them our way. Uh, you can do that anyway, anytime. No need to be apologetic about it. Um, it, this is all going to change in September. And why? Because in September, the Serbo-Croatian translation of Search for a Nonviolent Future will be published. I don't even know what the title is going to be. I, gotta, I should find that out. Uh, and I'm going to go over there and do a five-city tour and really get this thing launched. And I'm going to put a lot of free copies. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> in the hands of students and then just be selling the rest of it. But so watch for a very different 2007 or 2008 anyway. Okay, any questions? Been hanging around at this point before we actually start the next section. Yes, Sam? I don't know. I think I can – I'm going to try to see them later this afternoon and I will find out. Yeah. They were at Global Exchange yesterday. That's an important institution in San Francisco. We'll talk about at some point. Uh, they're basically up here trying to get some advice and support to how to do it. Yeah. So San Francisco, Berkeley is where you come and that kind of advice. Um, which is – it really is too bad because I was hoping to dramatically improve my Spanish by the end of the day. <laughs> Another way. Um, okay. So the big – the difference between insurrectionary movements per se and the kinds of reform sub-insurrectionary movements that we'll be concentrating on now is not very great. As I've said before, it was just – a convenient way to organize the course. And you'll see the, the issue that the campaign that I want to focus on today – and I actually came out in sync with the syllabus. That's to be appreciated and enjoyed uh, – is the Lachzak Satyagraha. And you'll see how it rapidly fanned out into basically every issue that we're facing today. Um, but I wanted to bring your attention to a couple of things in the reader before I start talking about Larzac. Um, I, as I, I know you may not have it with you, but on page 67 there starts this section from James Tracy's book, Direct Action, which is about radical pacifism. Now, should that be a topic that interests you and perhaps you want to write your paper on, there's also a very nice book by a fellow named Scott Bennett. Let's get this down here.
It's called Radical Pacifism, and the subtitle is The War Resisters League and Gandhian Nonviolence in America, 1915 to 1963. <coughs> Syracuse University Press. There was a very substantial nonviolence component in the Peace and Conflict Studies program at Syracuse long before there was one at Berkeley, actually. I'm embarrassed to admit. So, but I wanted to just uh, outline a couple of things that Taylor points out, Tracy, I mean, points out. Um, in the 1940s, he starts off a small but dauntless movement whose adherents turned themselves, termed themselves radical pacifists, emerged out of the conscientious objector population of World War II. Okay, so that's a population that you're very familiar with from the film The Good War and those who refused to fight it. And we saw how the government inadvertently planted the seeds for a lot of radical nonviolent action that was really sweep through the country for 30, 40 years. Despite its small size, the movement made an enormous impact on post-war American dissent. So post-war American dissent is going to range from the Symbionese Liberation Army and Patricia Hearst and, uh, you know, bombing police cars and stuff like that all the way over to strictly nonviolent uh, operations. And this radical pacifism led to core the Congress of Racial Equality without which there would not have been the Freedom Rides and really no Civil Rights Movement. The War Resisters League, WRL, which has been – holding up the torch for pacifism specifically, that is anti-war militancy in Europe and America. Ever since then, it's one of the longest running peace organizations that's in existence, probably second only to International Fellowship of Reconciliation, which also got started then. And CNVA, the Committee for Nonviolent Action, we did a lot of demonstrations and protests and civil disobedience actions at nuclear power plants and was on hand to help spark plug anti-Vietnam movements. Okay, these groups would stamp post-war American dissent with certain characteristics. So this is this – I picked this introduction here because this is like the most succinct way of describing what that movement was all about. And here are the characteristics. A tactical commitment to direct action. A tactical commitment as opposed to a deeply theoretical commitment to direct action. An agenda that posited race and militarism instead of labor as the central social issues in the United States. So my parents' generation, the 20s and the 30s, is characterized by a framework in which it's class struggle. It's the poor working stiffs against what they called in Italy, gli industriali, capitalists, you know, capitalism. And all the folk music that I grew up on, uh, I played in Greenwich Village. Uh, if you twist my arm, maybe <laughs> I'll bring my guitar here one day. Probably not. Uh, <laughs> it was all, you know, Pete Seeger and all – and Woody Guthrie and all of those heroes, which was derailed by Bob Dylan into a rather different kind of – protest and consciousness. We didn't actually like Bob Dylan. We thought he would never get anywhere. <laughs> and guess what? We never got <laughs> anywhere and he became Bob Dylan. Well, what can you do? <laughs> but clearly that era of the 20s and 30s was all dominated by the frame at – using the term the way George Lakoff would use it – the frame of communism and socialism versus capitalism. Although you had people like John Kenneth Galbraith saying, the difference that in capitalism man exploits man and in communism it's exactly the other way around. In other words, it reorganizes who's doing the domination and the exploitation, but the system is still based on domination and exploitation. So the first attempt to change the frame, uh, racism becomes much more important. Racism and to, to a lesser extent, unfortunately, I think, militarism. Racism also turned out to be, in a way, a red herring in the same sense. This is my own personal 
opinion, a highly controversial one at that. But I do believe that while racism is definitely an evil, just as economic exploitation is definitely an evil, it doesn't work out very well as the sole issue that you want to <coughs> focus on. Uh, so carrying on with the characteristics, an experimental protest style that emphasized media-savvy symbolic confrontation with oppressive institutions. Okay, and that's, that's true. They were symbolic. They were designed to attract media attention. And uh, I think for that reason they were, again, somewhat problematic. So we're getting better than the Haymarket riots and things and with all the things that anarchists did, with World War I era and on up to the 30s. But still we haven't really assimilated our Gandhi and understood that symbolic action – again, my highly unpopular opinion – symbolic action is best done when you don't go after the symbol but you go after something concrete and it has symbolic resonance. Gandhi, 1931, comes to Britain with two goats because he's not drinking cow's milk because it's a protest against Holland, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, because of the way cows were treated in India, he refused to drink cow's milk, which is a, almost like going on a perpetual fast to, for Hindus not to drink milk. Very striking, symbolic thing, but it was a real concrete thing to protect real, honest to gosh, cows. He has to get goat's milk. And how's he going to get goat's milk? Well, they don't have a lot of goat's milk in, uh, on board ship. <laughs> or we're going to talk about sheep's milk in a bit today, but this is goat's milk. Uh, so he has to bring these two goats with him. Well, the result was he was followed by crowds of reporters everywhere. So there was incredible photo ops to see this funny little man uh, wearing his minus fours, as he called it, and you know, no hair, practically no teeth, followed by two goats and thousands of adoring admirers. Okay, carrying on. Yet other characteristics of that kind of seminal era leading up to the one we're going to be focusing on. An ethos that privileged action over analysis, which again I think was something that we borrowed from Marxism and was really an exaggeration. It ended up being such an exaggeration that people refused to study nonviolence as though studying it would contaminate you. The result of that in turn was A, people really shy on inspiration because you don't read about Gandhi and King and stuff. You know, what are you going to read? God forbid. The newspaper? Heaven, saints preserve us. And secondly, not, not, did, not only did they not have a strategy, they didn't know they didn't have a strategy and they were opposed to having one. Now there's another characteristic that goes along with this that isn't mentioned in this list. I think it's not mentioned in this list. Uh, no, it is. Okay, so I'll save it <laughs> until we get there. Now, of course, you know, Marx had said the point is not to understand problems after all but to change them. And he came from an environment where left brain stuff was overemphasized and people weren't taking action. So the reaction sets in and we have right brain folks getting out there, getting in the face of the police and stuff like that, but not thinking for a minute about what they were doing. Um, it extolled nonviolent individual resistance. That's true, especially when it involved, quote, putting one's body on the line. It's considered a very dramatic thing to do. And an organizational structure that was non-hierarchical decentralized and oriented towards consensus decision making. So this is all just this paragraph in the lead-in to uh, Tracy's study. Now I think what he says about decentralization is actually an understatement. Uh, in fact, there was the same kind of aversion to leadership, to authority that there was towards theory. And I'm happy to say that today I think we're getting over that. Although that group that came and spoke to us a couple of weeks ago, which Amy so very correctly and usefully went up to chat with at the end, 
they represent to my mind a kind of holdover of this old style. So this is why in PAX 164A I spent a fair amount of time – in fact, I think I repeated it several times – going over with you some of the elements of Gandhi's leadership style because it was neither I am the leader, you follow me no matter what, nor, oh, there is no leader. We're all just doing this together. He had a balance in there. And if you remember, when there was a, an intense conflict and people needed to act very efficiently, he said, I am your general and I expect you to obey my orders implicitly. Now, does that sound to you like a nonviolent activist? But, he said, if you don't like me being your general, just say so. I'm happy to go up to the Himalayas and find a nice cave and a couple of goats and just you know, re try to realize God and never mind all of this political stuff. So that's the difference. Not that the person shunned authority, but he did not cling to authority for his own personal uses. He didn't abuse it. And I think we're starting to discover that now. And it's, it's interesting how sometimes even a single word can help when you're groping for some kind of concept. Because you have people in my generation totally rejecting leadership and you look at some of the statements by the incumbent president of the United States, you can see why <laughs> you might want to reject it. He actually said, as you know from seeing all of Michael Moore's movies, he actually said this, it would be a lot easier if this place were a dictatorship and I were the dictator. So clearly you don't want to go in that direction, but you eventually discover that just going in the opposite direction leaves you leaderless and that's not too good either. Um, so people in the 80s or late 80s starting to grope for a concept that would kind of make this acceptable. And they came up with the word mentorship, which I – okay, whatever, you know. Uh, I think it's a reasonable word. So finally there's a role again for people who are over 30. I mean I myself was one of those who were going around saying, don't trust anybody over 30. And then on January 20th, <laughs> 1967, I said, whoops, <laughs> we got – let's rethink this. <laughs> so I was very happy that – the word mentor could come back in and one could use one's accumulated experience without being a fathead and you know, trying to take over people's lives and dominate them. Okay. Well, that was just by way of giving us a sort of historical background and run up to the movements we're going to be looking at now. And we're going to start with anti-militarism because that is probably the closest single – issue to insurrection. Why do I say that? Because I think that in the minds of the conservative minds of most conservative people, whether they realize it or not, militarism and the well-being of their country, militarism and patriotism are so fused <laughs> that whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you can't disentangle it. I'm speaking about the American situation I think it's a little bit better in Europe. But this goes back thousands of years and there even is a theory about the unsolved assassination of Martin Luther King that people tried to mess with him. That, you know, the FBI was harassing him and things like that while he was mostly about racism, which is one of the reasons that I say I bet racism isn't the key issue. And I have other reasons for saying that too. So they're okay. So they tried to plant bugs in his hotel rooms and things like that. And they made life uncomfortable for him. They were not happy with him when he went north and started to talk about poverty. They weren't happy with him. But after April of 67 when he comes out against the Vietnam War and starts to say that he's going to organize a march on the Pentagon, he died. And there is, one th there is one theory that states that that uh, hit was ordered when they felt that he was going against militarism, when he was going to interfere with the nation's ability to carry out the war in Vietnam. That's a horrible theory in every sense of the word. It's just pure speculation. 
But I bring it up here only to say that I think there is a, a plausibility to it. And that is that if you're against militarism in some you know, form that looks serious, you are perceived to be being against the state. It's not a happy comment on what we think the state is, but uh, what some people think the state is. So we turn our attention now. Uh, John, are you almost ready with that? I think. Yeah. You may, you may have to move or else – yeah. R.B.? Well, it I think it's it is a uh, it exists everywhere, uh, and after all, in the Middle East, it would be a little bit different because the dedication is not to the nation state but to some overarching entity. I think it's it's a matter of degree. It's different in different places. For example, I was staying in a pensione in um, Florence as many years ago, and I'm sorry, John, I got you all started in it. And then, uh, you know, I found myself talking with the signora who was running the place. She, she we were very good friends. She loved my daughter. She didn't know I was Jewish, so it turned out that everybody in the family had a had a completely different political uh, position. And she was an unreconstructed Il Duce fascist. <laughs> so made conversation, aside from the fact that my Italian wasn't all that great, it made conversations a little bit difficult. But so at one time I, I said, uh, you know, perché? Why are you still in favor of Il Duce? And she said, I just wanted what was good for Italy. You know, more violence, more militarism, more dehumanization, more exclusion will be good for the state. And if you uh, don't ask me how or why. What really is going on, I think, is to be good for my ego. My ego is the state. Therefore, this will be good for the state. But if you remember um, when we were talking about scapegoating in 164A and I talked about the Roman institution of uh, gla gladiatorial combats, there was a Roman philosopher who was asked, do you think the gladiatorial combats are good for the state? And he said, oh, yes, they're very good. It's good to bring all of your violence to bear on one helpless individual or group. Good in the short term. So yeah, I think it can happen anywhere, but it's become a, a disease in the United States. And it's just – you know, it's like a hundred years out of date. That's, that's the problem. The very, very astute thinker uh, Richard Barnett said that the, the tragedy of America is to have perfected the art of killing in the very century when it went out of fashion. Not that it went out of fashion in the sense that people don't do it. God knows they're doing it all the more. But in the sense that somewhere most people are beginning to realize this is not working. And if they had even a glimmer of that there was an alternative, we could get out of this. Okay. Let's take a look at a few pictures because for the rest of the time I'll just be yakking here. And I want you to see these guys. If you could uh, – Ahmed, can you – oh, the lights are over there. Can – yeah, thanks. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, this is a, a picture of, uh, of John's computer <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with our hero here in a very – this is characteristically how he appeared at the end of his life. Oh, our hero. I haven't told you that we have a hero today. <laughs> His name is Lanza del Vasto, and when we finish with the pictures, I'll give you more of the biographical information. I interestingly enough, he was born in 1901, the same year that André Trocmé was born in France, and we'll get back to that. This rather less distinguished-looking individual is uh, Jean-Pierre Muller, who was a very well-known and very, very good, I think. Nonviolence theorist. He wrote a book called Vous avez dit pacifisme? You said pacifism? <laughs> and he's, he's a really good Gandhian. And this is a man named Boulardier who uh, played an important role in anti globalism struggles later and was also an author. But this is a very typical look at our man, Lanzo del Vasto. I, 
Uh, I met him – because you knew I was going to say that, right? Uh, I met him in San Francisco probably about 1978. That's what he – this is a homespun uh, sheep's wool made in his community. And he looks kind of like a sage. I think he was trying to give that impression. He sort of, he sort of deserved it. Okay, so now we have to shut this down and <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this uh, let me get you the exact year here, and then I'll start from the beginning and reconstruct the whole story. So you can see where we are at, but. Trois secondes, huh? <laughs> Just give me a minute here. Um, yeah, this is a, a campaign that went on from 1957 to 1963. It was an action against torture in Algeria. We've come across some very, very strange customs that barbaric people have all over the world. We ran across two nations where people didn't like voter fraud. That's extremely strange. And here now we have people who have some kind of objection to torture. I don't know. If I were back in New York, I'd say, you got some kind of problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> but this was one of many issues that they uh, w were protesting. I guess that's about the best we can do for focus. Probably it's a very oh, small yeah. picture. Yeah. Yeah. But what they did was they chained themselves in a ring around an obelisk in Paris. And they unfurled this banner saying, nous aussi sont suspects. We we're also suspects because Algerians were being arrested just on the basis of their being Algerian and uh, held and interrogated. In the meantime, in the Kasbah in Algiers, uh, uh, guerrillas were being picked up and tortured. I don't know if any of you have seen that very, very disturbing, very compelling documentary called the Battle of Algiers. It's a very, very moving thing. And it was, a, it was quite a shock for Western Europe because they had had this ideology that, that there was this aberrant nation that sprang up in the middle of Europe and it, it practiced torture and that was not a European thing to do. And the good nations were all victims like uh, France and England. And within 10 years, France was practicing torture in Algeria and within 20 more years, the cert a certain nation is practicing it in Guantanamo and sending people around the world for extraordinary renditions. So this was very puzzling to people who maintain the traditional view of violence and nonviolence, namely that the ends and the means are completely separable. And if you used violence to overcome Hitler, uh, then you would just go back to being a, a a good guy, but Gandhi had said – this is one of the most disturbing and challenging things that he said. He was asked to predict whether the Allies would win in World War II and he said, they are going to win, but in order to do so, they will have to be more brutal than Hitler because they have chosen to use his methods. So from the logic of nonviolence, this was all perfectly predictable. But, you know, there you go again. Nobody asks us. A mob descended on Belgrade, yada, da, yada, da. Off we go. So this is prior to the uh, issue that we're going to be talking about. It shows you that th these, these people – and I'll tell you more in a bit who these people are. I think we had one more. Yeah, two more actually. Yeah. This is another picture of Lanzo del Vasto. It's quite unusual in that he's wearing a sport coat. Uh, he almost never did that, but I guess they wanted his picture for a book jacket. He was a pretty successful writer. One of his books should be somewhere on this messy desk of mine. Yeah, Warriors of Peace was one of this – there's his picture. <laughs> okay, now then to just orient ourselves geographically, we'll show the last one, Carte France Département. Yeah, this is – as you know, France is divided into 82 départements or departments. It's done by one of the many things that we owe. 
have to be grateful to Louis Napoleon for. In fact, it's the only one <laughs> that I can think of. And this is the Dordogne, this region here. The Pyrenees start here. And interestingly enough, Haute-Loire is right here. And that's where Le Chambon uh, had unfolded uh, during World War II. And that's where I say it. it's kind of an interesting coincidence. André Trochme, who's going to be the leader here, was born in 1901. Lanza del Vasto, who's going to be the leader here, was born in 1901 in Italy, of uh, partly Italian and partly noble, uh, par partly Italian, partly Austrian, but both uh, nobility families. Um, well, okay, I think this kind of sets the scene. Now let's get on with the story. Ah, sorry about that. <laughs> there. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I, I choose this event. And here we're, we're having a slight change of pace here. I'm not going to do this with a movie or anything. I, and I haven't given you much to read about it. I just thought I would try to walk you through it. So that means that when we come to something interesting, let's stop and discuss it as opposed to you know, noting it down and having to talk about it later on. All of this contingent on our chalk supply, which is sort of like – oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, very good, Joanna. Thank you. You must be a science major. <laughs> good. Okay. So his full name, if you're interested, is Giuseppe Giovanni. Oops, sorry, Giovanni Lanza del Vasto. Okay, and his dates are 1901 to 1981. He died at 80. André Trocmé died at 70 in 1971. Um, and he's often referred to as Gandhi's first disciple in the West. Uh, in 1936, he was studying art and he was pretty good at it. But he began to feel that something was missing. You know, another famous art student, failed art student from that era is Adolf Hitler. He's another one of these funny little coincidences. Anyway, uh, he decided to go to the land of wisdom. So in late of 1936, like Michael Schuck, he betook himself to India, and some others of you also, uh, in order partly to meet Gandhi because uh, he was the one person who knew how to get rid of violence. And uh, he spent a lot of time with Gandhi in 1937. And Gandhi will actually bestow on him the name Shantidas, which is mostly how he is known subsequently. So Shantidas, Shantidas means servant of peace. Shanti, peace, das, servant. Um, and after spending a good bit of time, he takes a pilgrimage to the holy river Ganga, the Ganges, and he has something of a a vision, sort of like Constantine at the Malvian Bridge, and this vision is go back and build. So he decided to go to southern France, probably because it was felt to be a very hospitable area. Southern France was, I would say, the San Francisco of Europe. Let's put it that way. Un grand accueil. Everybody was welcome there. And he went to set up a community with Gandhi's assistance, and he does that in 1948. And this community is basically a flop. It doesn't work. I should say that uh, and this community was called the Community of the Arc, Communauté de l'Arche, and it didn't last very long. So these are the key dates. 1937 with Gandhi, 1948 first attempt to start a community which leads to uh, échec total, 
complete flop. And in 57 to 63, he is involved in the torture Algerian issue. I'll just put that here, Algiers. One of the last gasps of old-fashioned colonialism in North Africa by European powers. We have much more sophisticated forms of colonialism today. That's part of our problem. Incidentally, I'm sort of interrupting myself. You're used to that by now. In that film, there's a very stunning episode where the general who's in charge of the operations in Algiers, uh, General Massoud, historical figure, he is being challenged by these journalists who come down from Paris and say, we understand you're practicing torture here. And he says, look, you guys, you sent me here to do a particular kind of job. I sent me here to do a job. Et vous devez en accepter toutes les conséquences. You have to accept all the consequences for what you did. You cannot send me out here and say, you know, defeat this country, but be nice. Once you send me out here to do it, I'm going to do it any way that I can. And you are going to bear the full responsibility for the methods that I use. Okay, so you can see why uh, 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 Del Vasto, who is a very uh, serious Catholic, this is, a, this is one of the reasons that there isn't a whole lot of connection between Trocme, who's only a few, maybe four or five hundred kilometers away, and Del Vasto. Uh, Trocme's community is Protestant. Of course, that was part of the thing. It was the Huguenot uh, department. But he's a very serious Catholic and uh, he, he in fact said later on, I went to Gandhi in order to become a better Christian, which was very smart. It sh shows you he had a modern understanding of what religions are. Then in 1958, France announces that it's doing the first atomic bomb and they carried out protest actions. And this will be quite significant for the development of anti-militarism in Europe because throughout the 70s and the 80s, it's going to really reach a very dramatic uh, climax around questions of the basing of middle range, what do they call them, strategic nuclear missiles in Europe. And in fact, it was a very important organization in Holland, the ICAV, the International Church Union in Holland, which started these anti-nuclear protests in the early 80s, partly after consultations with Daniel Ellsberg. So it just it shows you once again how people can seed each other with key ideas at the key moment, get it into the right institution, in this case the churches, and it can take off. Okay. Then in 1963, wrapping up the Algerian things, he undertakes a fast in Rome to demand that the Vatican Council condemn weapons of mass destruction in the acknowledgement of nonviolence. I think I translated that correctly. <laughs> but anyway, nonviolence has got to be accepted by the Council and they've got to come out against mass destructive weapons. You might say that this was a, another échec, another failure, but in fact in 1983, the American Catholic bishops joined by French Catholic bishops and the German Catholic bishops all issued a statement called God's Challenge and Our Response, saying that nuclear weapons could not be justified under just war teaching as it has come down to us from Ambrose Augustine and all the rest of them. Uh, for one thing, proportional means is absurd if you're dropping an atomic bomb on people. And so therefore they were willing to accept it as a temporary measure while an actual policy could be developed. Of course, that's the problem. Once you've got a nice temporary umbrella, you go to sleep. There's no policy. It's the same old, same old. But then we come down to 1972. So this is the fast in Rome and there'll be several such. And here's where the story I particularly want to focus on begins. 
and that's what I'm calling the Larzac Satyagraha. Just to give you an idea of what other things the community of the Ark went on to do, this will last nine years, by the way, 1972 to 1981. 76 to 79, there were more anti-nuclear actions. 1983, by this time Del Vasto is gone. And there's a fast in Rome to renew the demand about the condemnation of nuclear weapons. And that's exactly the year when the Catholic bishops did come out with a statement saying that, well, okay, they're okay for the time being. Um, in 1987, the same community – and I'm going to say a little more about the community in a bit – the community got involved in an indigenous struggle, namely the Kanak people who were not there, not on their ge geographical turf at all. This is, so this is – here we see, you know, just picking up all the threads of all the great – all the dimensions of the great anti-globalism struggle, they find themselves going from one to the next. In 1990, they uh, again tried to stop nuclear weapons. In 1991, they carried out a fast in Paris on the occasion of the Gulf War and they had an inter-religious prayer ceremony there in Paris which has become one of the fairly characteristic events or happenings that will take place at nonviolent uh, uprisings these days. And 1992 to 1995, various actions for peace in former Yugoslavia. And 1995, they join with a very important Catholic radical organization called Pax Christi to have another interreligious prayer service at UNESCO on the anniversary of – 50th anniversary of Hiroshima. And I'm afraid that's where my information ends. I don't know what they have been doing for the last 10 years. But I do know the, the community is still in existence. So this community was started in 1963. Um, they bought uh, 1,200 acres um, on an, in an area called La Borinoble, which is in the Rhone Valley. In other words, it's an area that is famous for beavers and uh, what would that be? That wouldn't be Chardonnay in the, from the Rhone. And I, what kind of wine would they be making over there? It's red anyway and it's darn good, but I can't remember <laughs> what kind it is. Um, in – okay, let's get down a couple of things. Now, I have to go back a little bit to give you the background for what's going to happen next. In, the air, in an area that was not far from their community, <coughs> way back in 1903, the government had set aside uh, 3,000 hectares. I think hectares are a little bit larger than acres. Uh, no, no, they're a little bit smaller actually. This is like 2.4. No, 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 I'm sorry, I take it back. I go back to my first guess. They're way bigger than acres. 2.4 acres per hectare. So 3,000 hectares is about 10,000 acres, has been set aside in 1903 for a military training field. Okay? Okay, tant pis alors. So, okay, that's going on. Uh, but in the January of 1971, the government announces that it's going to uh, – sorry, sorry. October of 1970, the government announces that it's going to expand this thing from 3,000 to 17,000 hectares. This is a huge land grab on the part of the government in 1970 when militarism is really not all that popular among the people. And this would have put at risk – Hold on to your seats now. This is going to be very serious. 325 tons of Roquefort cheese every year. So that means <laughs> we'd be completely dependent on Holland for our cheese, which would be okay with me. I think their stuff is pretty good until California, of course, will come along and uh, try to get into the act. But seriously, uh, there were five, 575 people would have their livelihood just – taken right out from under them. Because this whole area is sheep grazing 
and this sheep's milk being made into Roquefort. This is going on for centuries. So there, there are some protests, uh, as is natural and acceptable. But in response to the protests in January of the following year, the government digs in and says, okay, you don't like 17,000? Try 20. We're going to expand this and take away more land. And it's finally at this point, early in 1972, that they called upon Lanza del Vasto, who had, and he was a Gandhian disciple. And so you see once again a very familiar pattern and a kind of very successful one where the leader does not invent the issue. It's like Martin Luther King coming in and sort of putting his stamp of approval on the lunch counter sit-ins that were started by four students from the University of Greenboro, North Carolina. It's, it's very – actually pretty common that the issue comes up on the ground and the leader comes in to help organize it, inspire people, frame it, teach how to go about it. So in this case, he's kind of a classic example of a third party expert coming in because he – you know, basically he's almost indistinguishable from a Frenchman at this point. <coughs> I think in southern France they probably would have accepted him. Well, if you get up around Paris, you have to be Parisian for about three generations before you'll be regarded as a French person. But I think in the south it's a little bit different. And so he's basically French, but he's bringing – deliberately bringing Gandhi into, uh, into play. And he feels that this community which he has set up in 63 is going to be an extremely important part of this. And all those of you who had Pax 164A will not be the slightest bit surprised. You'd be delighted but not surprised because this is a discovery that Gandhi made already in South Africa. 1904, 1910, he starts his first two communities in South Africa, later to be called ashrams when he goes to India. And we've discussed at length why they're so important. The, uh, the basic reason that I'd like to leave you with here is it, from the 70s onward, it's becoming slowly clear that for some reason, big institutions aren't working. Corporate bookstores, corporate coffee, Corporate healthcare, corporate universities. You know, you have this wonderful thing. Oh boy, the university just got half a billion dollars to study alternative energy. That's terrific till you discover that alternative energy means nuclear, genetically modified, all of these things. Yes, this is this is gonna be called the the UC Satyagraha is shaping up here. But anyway, so the point that I'm making is, and I don't know why this is the case, but yeah, I think I do know why. <laughs> For some funny reason, the big institutions which are hierarchical, top-down, based on domination uh, and ones in which the human individual doesn't count for much, they're not working anymore. Because in all these big institutions, you have a department called human resources, right? We've all heard about that. And it's very casual. I, wor I work in HR. You know, I'm an HR person. Now, if Immanuel Kant were to come back here, you know, if we had a huge copy of the Die Kritik der reinen Vernunft and we waved a candle over it and he were to be invoked, I would ask him, how do you feel about human resources? He would be furious. Anyway, as furious as he could get. And he would say that a human being should never be treated as a means to an end. A human being is an end in himself. We would even go on to say a human being is an end in herself. So the reduction of the human being to a functionary in a, lar in a, in a non human entity has its limits. And if you go about it the wrong way, it just will not work anymore. So, therefore, whole new forms of living and uh, being together, new communities that are not dependent on nation states. Uh, in which you can live close to nature and things like that are critical nuclei from which the new world that I hope you end up living in is going to come. 
So he, s he defined his community as a voluntary association of converted persons. You know, in his case, that meant converted to the basic principles of the Christian faith. That's what meant in his case. And here is the charter of the Ark. Following Gandhi and Lanza del Vasto, the members of the Ark have made the choice of nonviolence, which is rooted in uh, what do we call it? Inner work, un travail sur soi, will work on oneself, Naglerian person power, and on a spiritual. Let's see, recherche means research, but it also means pursuit, spiritual pursuit. Yeah, they choose, and there are four basic things: to uh, service and sharing. To open themselves to service and sharing, to live simply, to respect all life, and to act for justice and peace by nonviolent means. So we have two very important uh, pluses uh, in our situation here. We have an astute individual who's been with Gandhi, he's, he's rather charismatic. He was a cool guy to meet, actually. You see him sitting there with his sheep's wool, rough hewn thing in San Francisco, and his big white beard. He, w he was cool. I really liked him. And you have his expertise, but it's a sort of gentle expertise, which is, which is politically okay, with PC. And you have a community where people have been practicing the future <coughs> and the means by which the future is going to be built. So these are two huge pluses. And the minute he enters on the scene, people who have been holding back in their protest because something in them says that you know, getting down your old hunting rifle and going against the French army is neither strategic nor principled, and they're hesitating, they don't know how to join the movement. Uh, the minute it becomes nonviolent under his direction, the, the ranks swell. You have a lot more people. In uh, March of 1972, 109 farmers who had been threatened with an uh, a, uh, imminent expulsion got together and 103 out of the 109, which is better numbers than Gandhi ever got, I think, but who's counting? 103 out of 109 swore that they will never sell or alienate their land. So probably you're dealing with a mix of motives here that are you know, partly excellent, partly selfless, partly you know, looking to the big picture, and partly just sticking up for oneself because um, farmers do not like to lose their land. They, are, they feel that their land is part of them and they can't just get up and truck <coughs> somewhere else. Is particularly agonizingly true in many parts of the less developed world, but it's even true in West Marin County where I live. They, it's it's a highly developed area. My criterion is they have lattes, <laughs> uh, and yet when one of the supervisors wanted to take some land and put it in, actually it was ridiculous. They wanted to put it into agriculture in perpetuity, take it away from the ownership of the farmers. The farmers got all upset and said, who's going to feed you if you take away our land from the farmers? Well, the fact is they hadn't produced an ounce of food in about 47 years. They just didn't want to lose their land. So, and another issue was the, the provincialism. Your, your southern French person is a very, very warm, accommodating, friendly person is also very suspicious of foreigners. And uh, in that, in these were the days of – NATO, and a lot of these French farmers down there were saying, I will die before one Englishman sets foot on my soil. <laughs> so they're kind of funny from our perspective. So, but I do think we have a mix of these personal motives and the bigger picture and the understanding that they are somewhat connected. Um, and they formed an organization for the campaign, which was a very good idea. 
and uh, Lanza del Vasto would arm with these 103 farmers, starts to introduce concepts of nonviolent action in a very systematic way. In April of 2000, uh, sorry, sorry, April of 1972, April 2nd and 3rd, they declared uh, an action and invited people to come and join them. And it turned into what they called Days of Joy, Les Jours de Joie. You can see the French would be pretty good at something like this. And thousands of people came from all over France. Uh, a lot of them were – it's sort of a new phenomenon now – nonviolence tourism. <laughs> You've heard of ecotourism? This is satyagraha tourism where people come to sort of see what's going on and get a flavor for it. And um, the headquarters in the community sends out lots and lots of posters and collects signatures. And for the next few months, there are just waves of resistance spreading throughout the country. Now, the first major demonstration or action occurs on July 14th. Pourquoi? Why July 14th? Yes, it's of course French Independence Day. And what they did uh, was march to Rodet, which is the capital city of the department, and the bishopric. And <coughs> 20,000 people are on this march. <laughs> and a whole bunch of tractors. People, tractors, and sheep are going to become the key players with the next phase of the Satyagraha. And it prompted the prefecture of the department to begin an inquiry into what he's calling public use of the land. Public use meaning being taken over by the military. And in October, they do their first um, public appeal by way of what you saw referred to as nonviolence of the deed. Five farmers – and 60 sheep drove to the Eiffel Tower and the farmers started to pasture their sheep on the grass around the Eiffel Tower. And I actually remember seeing pictures of this in uh, newspapers. Uh, the police arrived and uh, ordered the sheep <laughs> to get into <laughs> paddy wagons. But the sheep being sheep, ils n'obéissent pas. They did not obey. And uh, this leads to two hours of discussion. You can just imagine the amount of press coverage. You hear the gendarme trying to round up the sheep, but <laughs> they only obey the farmers and their, and their own dogs. It was a terrific ploy. I mean, it was one of these staged symbolic actions that we've been reading about, which was very, very successful. So after two hours of discussion and much press coverage, the farmers were escorted to the outskirts of the city. And the one thing that stays in everybody's mind and it's going to be very important and you will immediately understand why – is the discipline. Even the sheep would only obey the lead sheep. <laughs> <laughs> but more seriously, they, it was non-disruptive, not impolite. Uh, it was very well disciplined, planned and carried out. And this immediately conveys a message to the people that, that we are not talking about Danny the Red running through the streets of Paris, digging up uh, the stones from the cobblestones from the street and throwing them through the windows of the police station. Right? Now, I don't know, you know, maybe you have no objection to this sort of thing. I don't know where I stand on it, but for the average French citoyen, you know, the average French person, this spelled chaos and disruption. And what these farmers were doing was very, very different. And there's a big tilt as a result of this demonstration to give them favor in the eyes of the public. Uh, nonetheless, despite all of this, at the end of that year, 72, the prefecture, that is the regional government, decides that they can take the land after all. The military can take the land. And given your sense of the dynamics of what's going on here, what do you think will be the result? Catherine? No. <laughs> yeah. 
So you, you sort of see what I'm leading up to. You have the people are, are doing their thing very well step by step. You know, they're building it up step by step. They're staying on track. So the law of uh, re progression, that's right, the law of progression is probably happening. The police and the government start to feel pressured. So they uh, overreact. What's going to happen? Paradox of repression is clearly, if they would ever ask us, which they never do, hello, are you out there? <laughs> they never ask us. This was totally predictable. And that's exactly what happened. So you, uh, the imagination uh, is all on the side of the protesters. And so what's now actually going on is that even though <coughs> it was the government that started it with their atrocity, you know, we're going to hugely expand this military base, run you people off, no more Roquefort cheese for the uh, good people of San Francisco. Um, they started it and defined the issue, but what you'll see is that the protesters under Lanza del Vasto's direction are taking the initiative. So they're being proactive and crafting the way that the government is going to have to confront them. And that means that they're setting the government up for a paradox of repression dynamic. Um, next year in January, after careful preparation and many, many, many road signs and placards, 26 tractors head for Paris. This is a, a convoy. The police surrounded the tractors during the night of the 11th of January at Orléans, where Joan of Arc crowned the, the Dauphin, the king of uh, France. And uh, so what did the farmers decide to do? The tractors were immobilized. They decide we will walk the rest of the way. Very – this is firmesa permanente. This is very nonviolent response. Uh, I, I've gone on record as saying that if you launch some kind of nonviolent action, you want to either carry it to a win-win confrontation where if they repress you and stop you, they will be the worse for it because they will look bad in the eyes of the reference publics. Or you want to make sure you can carry this thing on to the end. Because if you start something and they stop you, uh, you're going to lose momentum and you're going to display an apparent weakness in nonviolence. Which is I, it's harsh to say that, but I am thinking particularly of a – there was a besieged city in Kosovo in the mid uh, – in the early 90s and uh, people in there were starving. Uh, the city was called Drenica. And people from Pristina and elsewhere, the women decided to bake bread and take it to Drenica. So this is every – they had everything going for them. You know, it's women. They're your best nonviolent warriors. It's bread, which is very concrete but also symbolic. They're taking it to starve and starving people. So you have to be pretty inhumane to stop them. Everything is going for them. But on the road to Drenica, they encountered a line of police and they turned around and walked back. And uh, now there were some people who were talking to us at that time and we said, you know, you shouldn't have turned back. And they said, well, you don't know what those Serb policemen are like. And then our, our attitude was then you shouldn't have gone. Much better not to do it than to try and see if the, if the opponent will cave in. And if he or she doesn't, then you go back. I realize this is very harsh to say that, you know, here I'm sitting here in this comfortable community surrounded by lattes. And I'm telling people they should go get their head beat in. But I'm not exactly saying that. I'm just saying, that, you know, wait until you're really, really ready to do this before you do it. If you're not ready, I bet you can find something else that you are ready for until you build up the courage and the strength and the wisdom to do the all or nothing thing. So the timing of this is very important. Uh, so that's why I think it's just super that they get off the tractors and proceed walking to Paris. And it's like the salt march down to the sea and it's like that famous sequence in Viva Zapata. I don't know if you all saw that movie. See, in my day there was like maybe five movies a year 
that you'd really consider seeing. So you saw all the good ones. And if Marlon Brando was in them, you definitely saw all of them. <laughs> and Viva Zapata was a tremendous movie. And there was a scene in there where they arrest him and they're taking him down to, I guess, the capital of the state. And peasants start coming out of the forest to join him by the time he gets down there. They turn around to untie him and there's you know, tens of thousands of people as far as the eye can see. So this march on Paris in January of 73 starts taking on that character. And then another thing happens, and again this is a point where I'm going to pause and give you a significant look and you're going to shoot your hands up and compete for telling us why this is important <laughs> and what the technical term is called. Okay, here's my – here's your clue. Tick, 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 tick. They founded the APAL or League for the Development of Larzac – that would be uh, accueil pur – I don't know exactly what it stands for in French. And they decide that they're not just a protest movement. But if you look at the educational system in the district, the government has been neglecting it. The schools are not very good. They're going to build schools. They're going to build all kinds of uh, handicraft leagues and things like that. Okay, start waving your hands wildly. Yes, Zoe. Yes, yes. So I hope you don't feel I'm treating you like a little bit like a puppet. But <laughs> in, the, uh, in your responses to the – the bringing down a dictator, I thought that was very, very good. I, I really like the way you're catching on to seeing the basic principles in the, in the individual activities. So here you suddenly have something which the government would have no purchase on. They, they can't go in there and say, you cannot have a league that builds schools. You know, I, don't, I don't want you having meetings and things like that. It's un they cannot touch it. It's non-confrontational. But the fact is you and I, you and I know that they're building up much greater strength uh, for the next protest if they have to have one. Um, so this – I'm not going to be able to quite finish this, so we, but that's okay. We'll carry on till on next time. In April of 73, uh, more than 50 farmers returned their papier militaire, their military service papers. You know, every red-blooded French male is issued these service papers which get start the process of your induction into the military. And here they actually take their papers and hand them in. So what's the new element here? This is a little bit subtler than my constructor program thing, but I think you ought to spot it. I will give you a hint. Yeah, John? This is civil disobedience, right. It is not against the law to get into your tractor and drive to Paris. It's a pain in the butt and it slows down the traffic. But there's no law that says you can't drive on the public road with your tractor. There's no law that says you cannot pasture your sheep at the Champs-Élysées. But there is a law that says you cannot hand back your papers. It's very much like the Hamad, Hamad de la Mosque in uh, – South Africa when they burned their passes. And you remember in the movie someone saying those passes are government property. You, you know, you, you can't destroy them. Um, and one – this is – it's on this occasion where one of these French farmers says, no English soldier here on my land. But more seriously, he said, this is what I fought, fought for in World War II, this, this freedom that you're now taking away from me. So uh, I'll stop here for – well, maybe go a little bit further. In August – again, we're still in 1973 – there's a mass demonstration in Larzac and it is uh, participated in by farmers, of course, and students and intellectuals. And I would imagine that some of the students were intellectuals. <laughs> And some of the intellectuals may still have been students. But this is, this is significant for what reason? I don't know that I quite have a technical term for this one. Maybe we should come up with one. But Marcella? Right. 
you're going to different sectors, right? Which is where the traditional left kind of failed in the 30s because they stood up for workers' rights. And there was this whole new class of uh, haute bourgeoisie, you know, of upper bourgeois echelons who were not factory workers. These are the people who would go on to found Hewlett Packard and things like that. And so the kind of appeal and the kind of issues that the laborers were st striking for were restricted to their community. But here they're starting to touch on a chord which is bringing in other elements of the civilization. So it is m it's much more important than just more people. It means that this, there must be some basic issue involved. These people are not just struggling for their own rights, for their own advantages. And you remember the uh, moment when that happens in Gandhi's career. Remember that from Tax 164a? And again, it's not unlike this thing here that in the sense that they didn't plan for it. They didn't go into the universities and say, we've got to have students. It just had a broader appeal. Alex, do you remember? That's right. And then the women shortly got these, uh, the laborers involved who had not been involved before. So it's going in the opposite direction now, which is kind of interesting that you have the indigenous people and the farmers who spread their resistance to other sectors of the society. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to stop here in terms of going through the story, but let me just give you a preview. Okay, preview of coming attractions because I, I go to movies and I know that you're supposed to do this. Uh, the reason that I have chosen this Satyagraha is partly because of its typicality in the way that it picked one issue which may have seemed pretty local but eventually ended up going to the heart of the big struggle called globalism or whatever we call it. It was typical in that regard. Typical in that it started with um, a local indigenous affected group. Maybe not so typical, unfortunately, we, should, we wish this would happen more, but it does happen some in that it had an expert who came from the outside to uh, play a very critical role and that you had a community already built to do this. Those things were not typical. Another, the important, I, I can't leave you hanging here in suspense. They won. <laughs> in 1981, the army had to back down. So that's where we're going to go next time, and then we'll talk about some of the other reform movements that you have in your reader.